Hey guys, just wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening to Sidebar Forever. If you like the show, please subscribe to us at SidebarForever.com as well as share episodes of the podcast on your social media. That way, new listeners can find us as well. Today's episode is a review of the 2021 Warner Brothers film, Judas and the Black Messiah. Based on the last days and months in the life of Black Panther's leader, Chairman Fred Hampton, the film details his revolutionary mission to unite oppressed groups across the city of Chicago, the Black Panther Party's conflicts with the Chicago PD and ultimately the FBI, and Hampton's betrayal at the hands of undercover informant Bill O'Neill, played by Lakeith Stanfield. Daniel Kaluuya delivers an electrifying, Oscar-worthy performance as Hampton, and actors Dominique Fishback and Jesse Plemons are also great in supporting roles. On the podcast, we discuss the effort it took writer-director Shaka King and producer Ryan Coogler to get the blessing of Hampton's family for this project as well as the filmmakers' attempts to stay true to real-life events while also staying true to their artistic vision. And, despite our quibbles with the narrative, how the film smartly weaves cat-and-mouse thriller with government conspiracy, love story, and biopic sensibilities. Judas and the Black Messiah is in theaters right now and available for streaming on HBO Max. Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois Black Panther Party. Repeat after me. I am, I am a revolutionary. revolutionary. I, am I am a revolutionary. revolutionary. I am a revolutionary. revolutionary. I am a revolutionary. Looking at 18 months for the stolen car, five years for impersonating a federal officer, or you can go home. The Black Badges are forming a rainbow coalition of oppressed brothers and sisters of every color. Their aim is to sow hatred and inspire terror. I will learn all that I can. I will learn all These ain't no terrorists. You can murder a liberator, but you can't murder a liberation. You can murder a revolutionary, but you can't murder a revolution. And you can murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder a freedom. So Judas and the Black Messiah is a 2021 Warner Brothers feature film directed by Shaka King. Uh, It's written by Shaka and a guy named Will Burson. It was produced by Ryan Coogler of Creed and and Black Panther fame. Mm -hmm. Uh, The movie covers a specific period of time in the life of Chairman Fred Hampton of the Chicago-based Black Panthers up to the point when he was murdered in his bed by the Chicago Police Department. Um, The film is set in the 1970s and Daniel Kaluuya Daniel Kaluuya stars as, uh, as Hampton. Dominic Fishback plays Deborah Johnson, uh, Fred's girlfriend and the mother of his unborn son. And Lakeith Stanfield plays William Bill O'Neill, the Judas referenced in the title. Right. Um, and this movie was released on uh, February 1st in theaters, and it's also available on HBO Max. Probably for another two weeks or so you can watch it, but it's it's Black History Month, so here we are. Uh <laughs> Not a perfect film, but definitely a very good one. Um, I think we had mixed reactions to it. Yeah, we uh, did. between Adrian and I. But what was your what was your what was your general first impression, man? After watching the uh, after, after watching the movie, um, my general impression was that it definitely well, like any movie, it's, it's not going to be perfect. But there were some things that were kind of glaring as far as like an omission and mm-hmm. um, some things in the narrative that you know didn't really sit right with me, but. Um, Kaluuya's 
performance as electric. I mean, he really just embodied Hampton. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I was um, relaying to you, like he even put on a bit of weight to get that that stocky build that um, Fred Hampton had. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Very noticeable, you know? And like the spirit of Hampton was present. You know what I'm saying? Like especially in the uh, scenes with the rallies and where he was, um, you know, giving his speeches and those um, sin- signature lines that we had always seen in like um, news, re- well, not newsreels by then, but like, you know, clips that you had seen, um, archival footage or whatnot. You know what I'm saying? Also, what was very remarkable too is um, Dominique Fishback's performance as Deborah Johnson. It's almost uncanny how much she also looked like the real Deborah Johnson back then. And if you look back in the um, footage then, you know, in the uh, days following Hampton's murder, you know, and you see her relaying what happened on that night, you put both of them side by side, man, I mean, it's just, just utterly remarkable. And then also you got to give a lot of credit to Stanfield as well, Keith Stanfield Mm -hmm. uh, for playing uh, William O'Neill. You know, I, I thought those three principles were, were very good in those roles. And, and the supporting cast was also very good. But just, yeah, was aside from that, just the narrative needed a, a bit more to kind of, you know, really make it a, a much more solid movie. And I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say, too, is just Martin Sheen is Edgar J. J. Edgar Hoover. Nah. Nah. Yeah. Nah, nah, not nah, not nah working. Mm-mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, his his makeup and his prosthetics were questionable at best. Yeah, uh, laughable at worst. <laughs> um, and, and really, the uh, the portrayal of I thought the portrayal of the Chicago Police Department and the FBI was pretty like like you mentioned, like mustache twirling, just kind of you know villainy one on one. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and I'm from Chicago. I'm from the south side of Chicago. So the Chicago Police Department is shit. Right. I mean, they're as, cor- they're as corrupt as, as it comes. But I do think that for the sake of the film, I mean, they just sit, they were just there to, sh- to serve as a device. And I think, you know, in terms of my own mixed reactions, you know, um, I, I agree with you. I thought, I think this movie is best served by the performances. And like you say, the narratives. The narrative maybe could have used uh, could have used some work. Um, Kaluuya is just spellbinding as uh, as Fred Hampton, and uh, Dominic Fishback brings a lot of heart and soul and a lot of perspective. They don't give her a ton to do, yeah, but she brings a lot of perspective to her portrayal of uh, Deborah Johnson in the movie, um, especially the scene where she talks about you know you you as a part of this party you can go out there and talk about giving your life. I have a life growing within me. I can't think that way anymore. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and so she has an, an extra responsibility, an extra, you know, burden to carry, if you will, you know, uh, being a mother, being an expect an expected mother. But, um, and I think Lakeith Stanfield probably deserves more of the credit than anybody else because he has the hardest job to do. He has the most heavy lifting to do playing the despised snitch, you know, William Bill O'Neill. Yeah, yeah. You know, Wild Bill. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, he has the most to do. You know, you've got to and, and the other thing is is as the movie is is being told by the filmmakers, you know, you see maybe more of Bill O'Neill's life than you actually do of Hampton's life to some extent. That's it's the- maybe fifty maybe fifty fifty. That's the other thing I was going to mention. I'm glad you brought that up. I really felt like um, it with within the narrative. That's one thing that could have readily, readily, you know, been improved upon is showing much more of uh, of Hampton's life because there's a part towards the middle of the second act, going into the third act, where he obviously goes up 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 river, you know, to to prison. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. To serve this bid or whatnot. And he's just kind of, you know, out of out of out of place, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? And it gives a chance for the rest of the supporting cast to kind of, you know, come to the fore a bit. So I understand why that was, but also 
I felt like Hampton's, uh, uh, not, not his largesse, that's the wrong word, but the, the impact that he had, you know, could have been deepened if you showed more of his life. And I think, you, you know, kind of the thing with biopics and things like that is that we already know what the ending is going to be. So it's almost exorable to, you know, you're almost waiting in the back of your mind from the first minute of the film to this conclusion that you know is going to happen. Yeah. You know, and all you're waiting on is along the way is, okay, well, how are they going to make this compelling to say, you know, if you think about someone who doesn't know, who perhaps doesn't know the conclusion of this, who doesn't know what happened, like a younger viewer or somebody, you know, are they making this compelling to someone who knows what's going to happen in addition to those who don't, you know? And I think that's that's the thing that could have been approved upon for sure, for sure. To your point, I didn't know exactly how it was that uh, that Hampton died. I knew he was shot uh, by the Chicago Police Department, but I didn't know, you know, the circumstances and, you know, I didn't know anything about William O'Neill um, oh, wow. or that he was okay. actually killed in his bed, you know, like literally in front of his family and, and in front of his friends. So that part was a surprise to me. And uh, and it actually did hit me, you know, pretty hard. And then also, like you just mentioned, going back and listening to uh, Deborah Johnson um talk about i think her name is akua J- nigeri now i think she changed her name now yeah. but uh have listening to That's deborah right. johnson back then you know weeks and months after this happened and talking and saying you know that you know what happened and you know how they pulled out oh we got a pregnant sister in here and then you know made them face the wall and you know and she said and then the pig said oh this one he gonna make it and then you you know they shot him and then it's Bam. like okay right you know now he's not yeah and it's just mm-hmm. like oh but um you know, for anyone who is who is not uh, has not seen the movie, uh, a brief synopsis is is that uh, Lakeith Stanfield's character uh, Bill O'Neill is caught stealing a car, and impersonating an FBI agent, and the real FBI makes a deal with him that if he infiltrates the Black Panther Party and gives them information, that they'll they'll let him off, they'll forgive uh, his crimes, mm-hmm. and of course, as he starts to form bonds within the party. Um, you know, there's a bit of a, an inner conflict, uh, you know, for his character. And then everything kind of starts to unravel, uh, as it does with any snitch who, you know, who goes undercover. And this film was, did you know this film was originally entitled Jesus was my homeboy? <laughs> what? Yeah. No, I didn't. Yeah. That's what, that was the original working title. And then they, they changed it to Judas and the Black Messiah. Thank God. <laughs> for the better. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure there's a reason for that, you know, you know, if one were to dig deep, but, but anyway, yeah, it was originally called, uh, Jesus was my homeboy, but, um, and a little bit of background about the film, uh, and I, and I'm, mm-hmm. I want to talk about this because, you know, this is a mo- this is a movie, you know, uh, but you know, we actually want to talk a little bit about, you know, cause Adrian is, is the, is the resident historian on sidebar forever. <laughs> so we do want to talk about the, uh, you know, the his, the historical, you know, Fred Hampton and then, the you know, the Fred Hampton that is portrayed, you know, in the movie and the other characters, too. But this story was pitched by uh, the comedy duo, the Lucas Brothers. OK. Um, and the script was written by the director, Shaka King and Will Burson. Uh, King directed one other uh, feature called Newlyweeds, uh, and he's written and directed some stuff for television. Uh, but this is certainly his, his biggest and most, uh, it's his biggest project to date. King and his collaborators drew influence for this movie from uh, other movies like Heat, mm. uh, Sorcerer. Uh, oh, the, really? Mm-hmm, they mentioned, uh, King mentioned Sorcerer, uh, The Departed, and uh, Friends of Eddie Coyle. Oh, yeah, that's a deep cut, man. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah very deep cut. And, and when I first saw saw the movie, I remember I was telling uh, Dwight and Adrian that, you know, to me, it's like one part biopic, one part, you know, like crime thriller, cat and mouse kind of thing. One part, you know, government conspiracy and then and then really kind of one part love story, because you really do get to see a lot of the tenderness and a lot of the bonding between Fred's character or the character uh, uh, played by Daniel Kaluuya, Fred and um, and his lady, uh, Deborah. Yeah. And Deborah. Yeah. But um but what what of what you know, you've mentioned a few things thus far Adrian, of what you know about the real Fred Hampton other than his physical presence uh 
Mm -hmm. What are some other the other things that you noticed that they filmed got right? And maybe some things where, you know, they took artistic license and said, hey, we want to deviate from that. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that I, I don't think the film expresses, you know, really explicitly is how young uh, Hampton was at the time. I mean, Hampton was you know, essentially a, a, a young man, a, a, a kid, if you will. And that's not to demean him at all. But, you know, when you're 20, 21, that is the beginning of your life as a young adult. Mm -hmm. And here he was at that age, you know, colluding these different, you know, um, 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 factions, if you will, you know, around the city of Chicago and the communities, you know, into like this rainbow coalition. So that part, I'm glad that they mentioned that. You know, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, as opposed to like, you know, what the Panthers were doing out west in Oakland and in other chapters, you know, really focusing in on, you know, the black power struggle, you know, almost exclusively. And even though Bobby Seale had said, you know, we're not just talking about just black people only. We're talking about the struggle for just equality with, you know, everybody. You know, Hampton really took it to that to that length, you know, there in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought the film did a great job of showing him going around to unite these 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 guys, these uh, factions, like I said, into one coalition. Um, so that 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 was great. Um, the other thing, too, is about uh, O'Neill, um, how he got kind of got caught up in that. Now, the, the thing that I noticed is, is that they did have to kind of uh, compress some things into certain scenes. Like the way O'Neill originally got caught, he stole a car and he drove it across state lines and he got caught by the police. And then the FBI was like, oh, it looks like we got a live one here, right. you know, that can do something for us. You know what I'm saying? And that's how they, you know, initiated him to, you know, infiltrate, you know, the uh, party and get closer to... Um, to Fred, Fred Hampton, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I thought, you know, them compacting that, that, that was good, you know, because you had to make that point immediately almost, you know, from the start, this is what O'Neill was doing. Um, the other thing that really uh, surprised me too was I had seen the documentary Eyes on a Prize, you know, several times over the years. And when you see, when you see Stanfield <laughs> made up as O'Neill in the beginning with that blue background, I was like, oh, I, I gasped a little bit because I was like, wait a minute, is that is that is that the footage or is that really Stanfield? It took me aback. I was yeah. like, damn, yeah. he really looks like O'Neal. Holy crap. So that part there, that really got me. And it, and it became more and it really went into relief when you see when they show the actual footage yeah. <laughs> of O'Neal at the end. And, and you're almost like, wait a minute, is this still the movie or is that the real footage? And it was like, wow. They, so, so I think to anybody who wasn't uh, aware of that, you know, I could see them being really amazed that they really did a great job of capturing, capturing that. I mean, to it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the other thing I wanted to say too, was there were several under other instances where I did have to backtrack, you know, and see, were these actual people that these things happened to? Like, for instance, um, in the movie, um, there's a, a younger brother um, named Jake Winters, mm -hmm. the character Jake Winters. Um, he is very fervent. He's enthusiastic for you know proving his worth um, to the party. And he gets set off to do something, you know, once his friend dies in the hospital, ostensibly at the hands of the Chicago PD. Yes. You know? And, and, yeah, he gets into a shootout with um, with the police and everything, and he's later killed. But I thought that character might have been um, taken from um, Bobby Hutton, uh, the real Bobby Hutton, mm -hmm. uh, who was with Eldridge Cleaver back in, I think, 67, 68. And they were caught by the Oakland police, and they had a shootout as well. So I was thinking at first, maybe they're trying to give a nod to that incident. You know what I'm saying? But Jake Winters actually was a real person. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, and the shootout also where um, at, at party headquarters where they had a shootout with the uh, Chicago PD. Right. Um, I thought that was taken from another shootout that happened in downtown Los Angeles in 69 where the uh, Black Panthers had a, um, had a shootout with the cops then, like in real life. But come to find out, 
there actually was a shootout in Chicago at that time with the Panthers and the police department around the time that the movie is set. So it's great that they did that homework and it wasn't just necessarily trying to take other instances from quote unquote Panther lore right. and use that to kind of fill in the gaps here. You know what I'm saying? They did their homework to find out, no, this is kind of what happened. Now we just have to find a way to uh, dramatize it and put it on screen here. Yeah. So, yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah, I remember that, and uh, I remember thinking the same thing. Well, did this actually happen? And with a lot of uh, biopics or period films, you know, where they're telling, you know, about real-life instances, a lot of times they will take multiple characters and kind of compress them into one right? for, for the sake mm -hmm. of, of storytelling and for, you know, to make the film move in a different way than real life did and, and than a novel did or anything else, anything else like that. Um, so I was kind of wondering too if a lot of those people and a lot of those characters were real and 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 how accurate they were. But but uh, to your point, um, both Shaka King and uh, Ryan Coogler, the producer, uh, they say that the family turned down many 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 lucrative opportunities to have a Fred Hampton movie be made. Hmm. Um, really? And you know once uh, Shaka you know, met with the Lucas brothers and they pitched him this idea. And then he, you know, had become friends with Ryan Coogler. I think at Sundance or something, they met at Sundance. And, uh, and then he brought Coogler on and they got financing, etc. You know, they approached the family. Um, and I guess you could make a movie about it anyway, because, you know, he's a, he's a historical figure, but I mean, he's a, he's a public figure. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. but they approached the family, uh, uh, Akua, you know, formerly Deborah Johnson, and Fred Jr., Chairman Jr., as he's known, mm -hmm. on and um, on, on multiple occasions to try to get you know get their blessings to make the film, and they turned them down. It took them almost like a year, I think, um, of going back and forth, and you know, and bringing them you know ideas, and this is who we'd like to cast, or this is who we've cast, this that da da da, you know, to get the, to get their blessings, and uh, mm -hmm. and then Chairman Jr. Uh, you know, once they did get their blessings, you know, he, he was constantly giving notes, harsh opinions on how things were portrayed, how the Panthers were portrayed, the way they dressed, the way they carried themselves, how much smoking they did in terms of cigarettes, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, you know, about how they were portrayed, uh, a cool with the same way. They even at one point demanded, uh, not demanded, but they even at one point requested uh, to meet Daniel Kaluuya and, and Dominique Fishback beforehand and, and that actually happened mm. you know they, they brought them to chicago they met at the quote hampton house um and uh you know and they they talked to him and said you know this you know and let basically you know air their grievances with you know with previous attempts and previous um you know requests to get them to be involved in the film and fred jr took daniel kaluuya out in the hood on the south side of chicago like 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 after midnight you know Oh, and uh wait a minute and it was on a weekend where uh a week where like the previous weekend you know something like a dozen people had been shot pop pop yeah that, yeah exactly you know so uh so it's real but you know daniel kaluuya said you know he met with them and he said he was fine with it he said he let them know look i'm not from hollywood i'm not from you know i'm from the real world mm-hmm you know, and uh, and he told them a little bit about his life and, and they really liked him. So it ended up working out. And oddly enough, a lot of this movie was shot in Ohio. I'm not sure if, if, if much, if any of it was actually shot in Chicago, to be honest. Uh, well, the locales look very authentic, you know, but obviously to a to your eye as a as a local, as a native, you would be like, mm, yeah, mm, close enough. Yeah, like yeah. there was there's there's some specific Chicago ness that I did not see. In the movie, but I mean, it felt close enough, and it certainly didn't didn't, you know, it didn't bring me out of the uh, the movie uh, to to pick that up. But yeah, I think they shot a good bit of it in uh, in Ohio, maybe in Cleveland, or uh, or somewhere like that, and and maybe for reasons that you know the Chicago, you know, the local municipality, you know, they might have been like, nah, 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 <laughs> nah, you, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're in the middle of BLM and, and protesting and. You know, uh, and just general, just yeah. We 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 have enough enough on our plate right now without you know, you know having this you know having to deal with this uh, this as well. But um, 
Mm-hmm. But um, what did you think of uh, the directing style of the film? Because, you know, Shaka King doesn't have a long, you know, a long history as a director. But I thought a lot of the shots were very stylish and photographed beautifully. Yeah. I thought there was plenty of drama. I thought some of the, you know, a lot of the camera movements worked really well. And I thought that there were, you know, there were a lot of points. I think a lot of the choices that he made as a director really brought a lot of uh, uh, drama to certain scenes. And it, and I, I think I knew before watching the movie, I think I had read that he was, you know, a relatively new, you know, uh, feature film director. But what do you think about the, the, the direction and the art, the art, the art style of the film? Oh man, I, I tell you what, I tell you what, man. Um, from the opening frames, like that first scene, that shot at night, just oof. I was like, oh man, they 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 getting it. Mm-hmm. Like you know, I was like, oh man, they getting this period right here. Mm-hmm. The cars, the dress, um, just everything. That that late night, just ooh. I was like, yeah, that's spot on. I'm I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that, man. You know. But before that, I think the film opens with uh, <laughs> with J. Edgar Hoover kind of addressing like the cadre of ages. And that felt so like yeah. 1984 Big Brother. I was like, mm, nah, nah. <laughs> yeah. Nah, yeah. nah. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't the way you wanted it to go, yo. <laughs> exactly. I was like, okay, okay. That aside, I mean, it opened very very strongly man and the other thing too that has to be given credit to is you can tell when it's a black director and possibly i i don't know if the dp the uh, director of photography was a brother or a sister or black as well but the way that the the black people were photographed yeah. especially yeah. at night yeah it, it has an art to that there really is you know and even in, and even in daylight believe it or not you know what I'm saying? It's a it's an art to photographing, you know, black skin tones. And I thought they nailed that tremendously. Yeah. Perfectly. Oh, it was so great. So great. You know yeah, what I'm saying? I, I thought so too, man. I thought so too. Yeah. Uh black and brown skin or brown skin, um, there really is an art to it. The uh the fellow who's the director, uh he's a Japanese fellow, I believe, uh, who directs the show Atlanta that Lakeith Stanfield is on. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. that director does a good job with it, and uh, a lot of the directors and the cinematographers on uh, Issa Rae, uh, HBO show Insecure, they do a, an amazing job of, uh, of photographing black characters, and black characters of all hues, you know, fair skin, brown skin uh, characters, uh, darker complected characters, you know, characters with, you know, with natural hair, with, you know, I mean, they, they capture it all really beautifully. So, uh, yeah, I would agree with you, and like you said, the uh, that opening scene, which, you know, reminds you of, you know, we, we mentioned some of the influences that uh, the filmmakers drew from, reminded you of that kind of uh, Scorsese, Goodfellas style, mm-hmm. you know, you know, shooting things from outside of a bar. And, you know, once you go inside, there's going to be trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, all of that. I, th- I thought that was, uh, yeah, like you said, that whole opening sequence was great. And the first time that you see Daniel Kaluuya as uh, chairman, um, you know, he makes the speech mm-hmm. and, um, and that's the first time that he actually meets, uh, Deborah Johnson. Um, you know, that was great too. H- Hampton, uh, Hampton, Daniel Kaluuya's, it's not an impression of Fred Hampton, but it's definitely, you know, him trying to embody that and trying to be, uh, a Chicago guy. Cause I, I told you there are a lot of guys I know from Chicago and my father's generation. They sounded just like that. Oh, that cadence. Of, he he nailed the cadence. Yeah. Yeah. They sound they sounded just like that. And he was dead on, you know, and most actors will say that they're trying to, you know, they want to get the body language. They want to get the sound of the voice if they can, but they don't want it to be an impression or to be an imitation. They want, you know, they want to bring something to it and make it make it a, a third thing separate unto itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that uh, I think he did that. What did you think of Jesse Plemons portrayal of Roy Mitchell? Because we talked about it a little bit on the phone, Edgar Hoover is definitely like the dastardly villain. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, as as he probably was in real life, to be honest. Um, yeah. But Jesse Plemons as Roy Mitchell is much. You know, he's much more laid back. He's much quieter. Uh, he's his. 
him initiating and bringing, you know, bringing Bill O'Neill in to become, you know, this undercover snitch, mm -hmm. it was almost more of a seduction than it was, you know, him using leverage against, um, against O'Neill. He would actually go back and forth between the two, but his style was more like, hey, look, you know, almost like, you know, if you do this well enough, maybe we'll make you a member of the FBI or some shit. You know, it was almost like that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even um, even when uh, O'Neill, uh, well, Stanfield as O'Neill was relating, you know, um, in, later in the film, he was saying, you know, it was kind of almost like, you know, we didn't have a lot of role models back then, you know, so I kind of looked at him as kind of like a role model. And especially when Mitchell, you know, invites O'Neill out to his house and he kind of sees how, you know, Mitchell is living, you know, with the with the family. Mm -hmm. and, you know, he has a nice, nice living, living quarters. You Make know. yourself a drink. Here's the good scotch, you know. Mm hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, relating to um, Plemons as um, playing Roy Mitchell, you know, I, I kind of agree as well with your assessment of it being a seduction almost. And the, the closest thing that I also related to it was like, you know, the uh, movie Deep Cover, you yeah. know, um, where Charles Martin Smith played, you know, the uh, FBI liaison to um, Larry Fishburne, well, Lawrence Fishburne's, mm -hmm. you know, um, agent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Deep Cover, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, you know, he would give him almost like, tidbits to keep him going like anytime fishburn would come back and say no nah, man i'm out i'm out I'm, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore i can't take it you know martin smith would kind of be like you know have you ever seen a crack baby have you ever done this yeah. you know this is why you're doing this and that's the sense that i got with uh mitchell because mitchell uses two instances of this same type of logic with uh, O'Neill. One is where he makes the correlation, <laughs> uh, wholly unjustly, of like, you know, the Panthers and the Klan, they're almost one in the same. Right. They both want to sow hatred and this and that. You already see how they do. You saw how they treated, you know, one guy that they found out supposedly was a snitch already. So what do you think they're going to do to you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And the, and the other thing that gives you that almost almost says almost makes him a sympathetic you know character almost is mitchell actually was one of the agents who was investigating the three murdered civil rights workers um down in mississippi mm -hmm. back in 1964 mm -hmm. like that's a real thing okay you know and he brings that up actually in the movie in the script you know and he says you know when I when when we found those two kids, man, they the clan had already done this and that to them and everything, you know. So you see, so you see, Bill, the clan and the Panthers, they're one in the same. Yeah. And you're gonna help us take them down. That type of thing, where yeah, it was seducting him with like you know almost like this horse and carrot, you know, like you keep doing this, yeah, you can have almost what I have. You might be an agent too, but also you would be doing some good you know, for your community by taking out this supposed threat of these Panthers. Right. So I thought, I thought Plemons did a good job of kind of riding that line. You know, he, he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily, you know, uh, mustache twirling, like, you know, how Martin Sheen was, <laughs> yeah. his Hoover. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought the other thing too, where the scene where, um, uh, Fred Hampton has just come home, you know, from doing his bed, and he's, you know, doing his I am a revolutionary speech, right? And in the crowd, we spy Roy Mitchell there undercover, you know what I'm saying? And just the way they shot him, they made him look so creepy, just, ah, ah. I was like, ah, just, ugh. And, you know, I thought if, O'Neill had actually noticed him there in the crowd because it wasn't it wasn't entirely clear did O'Neill notice him at first or if he did at all, but I thought if O'Neill would have been you know with his fist raised and sloganeering you know with Hampton if he had just kind of spied Mitchell in the crowd and Mitchell just kind of stand there like <laughs> remember remember what you're supposed to be doing yeah yeah we here yeah remember what you're supposed to be doing bro <laughs> and Mitchell, Mitchell even tells. He even tells him after the uh, after the fact, he's like, "Yeah, I saw you there. You believed him." 
You 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 you, 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 you getting it? You were you were into it. I saw you raising your fist. No 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 no! Don't act like you wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's why I just feel like if O'Neal, you know, had just kind of been like, oh, oh shit, you, you, you were there? You know, that type of thing. Like, we got a long reach, bro. Yeah. Long reach. Yeah. One of the uh, the things you brought up, and I thought it was it was a fair point uh, in, in terms of the narrative needing some strengthening was why the FBI and why Hoover was so dead set on nailing this 20, 21 year old kid on the South side of Chicago. Yeah. Who's, you know, it's a different chapter than even the Oakland chapter in terms of its, yeah. you know, in terms of its life. But, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, you know, when Hampton, Hampton was associated with the Panthers, but he didn't join until later. They actually approached him and asked him to join because he was a part of other organizations. I think he was part of a religious organization. That's right. That was, yeah. that was involved in civil rights. And when he joined the Panthers, I mean, their membership grew into the thousands within months. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing that Adrian mentioned earlier about the Rainbow Coalition, and it's, it's shown in the film, but I think it could have been undercut, uh, not undercut, but it could have been uh, buttressed had they uh, gone back and said, so he, he, you know, he was, you know, they had a uh, breakfast program that was feeding, you know, hundreds and thousands of black children breakfast every every week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was trying to galvanize, you know, black people around what the, the Black Panthers were doing. And he was, you know, he was a teacher and he was a mentor to, you know, to those who were new to the uh, to the chapter. But he was also trying to galvanize, uh, you know, a lot of the poor whites in the city of Chicago who had come from the south who were also being mistreated and being uh, uh, shit on by the local Chicago police department and the Latin community. Right. So now you see these, you know, seemingly disparate, you know, sections and groups of people working together. That was a threat. Mm -hmm. That was a real threat. I don't know if there's more to it than, than that that you wanted to share, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, he was also trying to work, and, and they showed it in, in the film, and I, I guess for reasons that, you know, they, they had to themselves, um, that they couldn't uh, identify them as, you know, the actual gang that day that they were trying to recruit, which were the Peastone Rangers, mm -hmm. and I think they were led by Jeff Fort, if I'm not mistaken, Okay, you know. And yeah, and Jeff Fort wielded some serious, serious influence. And I think they showed that into the main uh, gang leader, you know, that he was, you know, communicating with. Now you're talking about, are you talking about the crowns? Then, thank you. Yeah, I was trying the, to remember the name. Yeah, of and the, gang. the leader's name was Steel. Steel, that's He's, it. That's uh, it. He said, yeah, yeah. Ooh, this nigga got some words on him, don't he? <laughs> 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 you know that was yeah, yeah that was something else that you brought up like i don't think other than amongst themselves you never hear any of the white characters use the n-word in the movie ever yeah and you know and that how can i put this it was glaring because on one hand it could be the overuse of it could almost be a, a stereotype could almost be like well they're supposed to say that but no epithets, no epithets were ever used. No, no, like you know, innuendos of like you know whatever you want to say were used. Anything like that. It, I, I kind of felt in that way. That's not how that would have gone down, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Like if, if the agents were amongst Hoover and amongst themselves, I'm sure they would have used more derogatory terms than that. You know what I'm saying? Just in the casualness of being amongst their own and talking about, you know, this case or whatever. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that that part was glaring. But I, I guess because they really didn't want that to veer too much into that territory, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, and, and plus, if, had they done that, it would not have made Roy Mitchell's character it, it would have made him lose any shred of um, sympathy or empathy, rather, right. um, that the audience may have had. Right. You know, because once he utters those type of words, then kind of the other thing about him talking about, well, you know, I was down there in Mississippi in 64 solving the case of the murdered civil rights workers. That goes out the window. Yeah. You know, saying so he can't say that he can't, you know, but 
Hoover and this other agent, they probably could have. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Yeah, I, I thought when you pointed it out, I thought about it after afterwards. And I suspect it was uh, an artistic choice by the, the director as a filmmaker. And mm-hmm. also, too, I think to add that on top of everything else would have made the FBI and the Chicago Police Department look even more cartoonish as as examples of the, you know, the antagonists or the villains in the movie. I guess O'Neill is technically the antagonist, but, you know, they were definitely the big bads um, and were pulling, you know, pulling the trigger behind the scenes and pulling the strings, uh, you know, so to speak, as far as he was concerned. But I, I did, once when you pointed that out, I thought about it and I said, well, maybe that was something that was it was a choice that was made. And I don't think the movie is lesser without it. Oh, no, no. But I no. do think that, like you said, it was glaring that, okay, hmm, like, hmm, you know. They, uh, they didn't say that? E- even given the time? And, yeah. 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 And also, too, uh, Jesse Plemons' character, Roy Mitchell, you know, you do spend a good amount of time with him, with O'Neill, him with Hoover. And so you have to kind of, in order for us to not emotionally or psychologically just shut him down, you have to kind of be on his side. He's being manipulated by his bosses and his superiors, and he doesn't necessarily want to do the things that they're asking him to do. And you have to kind of believe he has a little bit of that in him. Right, right. So I would, uh, I would agree with you. Uh, I would definitely agree with you there. You were talking about the, uh, the footage of, uh, of Lakeith Stanfield as, uh, as William O'Neill in the beginning of the film and then the footage of the real O'Neill uh, being interviewed later on uh, for the uh, for Eyes on the Prize. Eyes on the Prize, yeah. Mm-hmm. For anyone who doesn't know, so William O'Neill, who is the snitch that infiltrated and ultimately gave the police the information they needed you know, to kill Fred Hampton, mm-hmm. he committed suicide in 1990. Yeah, that I did not know. So when they showed that bit, I, I did I I didn't know what happened to O'Neill after. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So the the interview was recorded in 1989. He killed himself in 1990. He actually ran out into traffic and was hit by a car. Whoa, really? And, yeah, and that's how and that's how he did it. And his wife at the time said it was an accident, but the police ruled it as a uh, as a suicide because he had been. He had been drinking, and I think he had threatened to jump out of a second-story window or something, you know, maybe the day before, days before. So he was definitely distraught. Mm-hmm. And and one would have to imagine that, you know, in light of all of this, you know, he, he was truly a, a, a terrible human being, but he was used. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was used, and part of him probably liked the idea of, of, you know, I mean, he was already imitating an FBI agent to, to steal cars. Yeah. So maybe part of him, you know, was, was a little bit, you know, elated at the idea of being associated with the FBI. And maybe there is something for me. He even says in the, uh, in the interrogation room, when he first meets the Roy Mitchell character and Roy Mitchell presents him with the deal to, to infiltrate the black Panthers. He says, why, why were you imitating an FBI agent? He said, because, you know, any nigga in the hood can get a gun and, and take a car. He says, but, it, you know, if you have a badge, you know, now you're unique. Now you're in, you know, you're in a, in, a, in a specific and unique place that not a lot of black black men are. And you can get anything. You know, you have an army behind you if you have a badge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, he said, you know, that was that was something he always he always kind of wanted to be. But um, I was going to mention, man, as far as, you know, flaws in the movie. Um, Mm -hmm. while I really like the film and I definitely recommend anyone to see it, it is, it is very pro black Panthers. Mm -hmm. Um, it does tell the story from their perspective and it paints them in a, in a, in a much more favorable light than, um, you know, than, than a lot of, uh, of history does. And that doesn't mean that they're right and that history is wrong or history is right and that they're wrong. Um, as mentioned earlier, the Chicago PD and the FBI are definitely played strictly as villains. And, and not that they weren't, because they fucking were. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I do know that myself, you know, having been a part of group situations and teams, you know, I do know enough to know that, you know, not everybody in the group has, you know, the best intentions and is out to do the right thing. And there were members of the Black Panther Party 
who were oh you know pretty fucking villainous themselves you know absolutely um, yes so that's that's reality but considering the conditions that a lot of those people you know the, those folks were living under and their relationship with the cops and law enforcement and their positions in society one cannot not expect that that kind of attitude is going to rise you know rise up out of uh, out of these folks the other thing mm-hmm. that i kind of took a little bit of issue with was Dominique Fishback's performance as Deborah Johnson is terrific. Um, you know, Deborah Johnson was a poet, and I understand from listening to an, uh, an interview with uh, Akua Najeri, the formerly Deborah Johnson, you know, she said that, you know, that meeting that they had at the uh, after Fred's speech, she said, I did ask him if he liked poetry, and he kind of like, eh, yeah, whatever. And she said she didn't tell him anything about the poetry. Oh. She said she, she just she just tucked it away and just kept on going and just, you know, just, you know. She didn't. She didn't share her poems with her or anything like that. That was, that was another artistic choice that the uh, the filmmakers and the the, the screenwriters made, um, you know, to 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 create a certain situation between uh, Daniel and uh, and Dominique. But the other thing I'm kind of tired of seeing, man, and you know, is the the soulful good woman who stands behind her even greater man. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of played, man. Well, do you feel like, let me ask you this, because, you know, there have been instances, obviously, and and I'll say not not just exclusively with black um, biopics, but this has been an issue before. You know, it's it's no different than like when um, Spike Lee was trying to get Malcolm X made back in 91, 90, 91, 92, and he had to go see Betty Shabazz several times. Mm you know, over the course of him writing a screenplay. And she, he said that she like cussed him out because how dare you, you know, put this instance in there. This didn't happen like that or whatever, you know, what, whatever issues that she had with it. Right. And I could probably see something like that here because in an instance, they're in control of the narrative now. You know what I'm saying? Like you're doing a movie in which I'm still alive. You know, and I was an active participant in these events. Right. So I kind of do have control as far as like how you're going to portray me, you know, and you see like the wives of um, of these activists, you know, whether it be King, uh, Malcolm, Hampton, whomever. Yeah, it's the same thing They're kind of like, you know, uh, off to the side a bit. But yeah, they are steadfast in their devotion to not only um their husbands or their significant other but also what he represents yeah you know what i'm saying so by by extension they're married to the movement you know literally so to speak but yeah you see that all the time absolutely yeah Yeah. and and even in other films you know that film first man that came out uh with uh oh with the astronaut yeah Yeah. directed by damien chazelle with uh ryan gosling and i forget the uh woman who Again, see now I, I forget the actor who plays his his wife, but you know this kind of supporting the man. But I mean, if you're going back in history, you know certainly there were there were you know there were limits on what you know people of color could do. There were limits on what women could do, mm-hmm. and so to some extent, a woman's you know even though women were integral to the civil rights movement and were integral, you know, to the changes, uh, you know that 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 went on you know, from the 60s to the, you know, into the early 70s, this period that we're kind of discussing, um, you know, back in those days, a woman's power and her place in society was kind of ersatz to her husband to some extent or to her man or, or you know, what have you. At least, you know, that's, you know, that's that's what we see and that's what we see that has been, how it's been portrayed. Um, yeah, you know, so. one other thing that while you were talking about um, issues that we may have, um, the other issue that I kind of have is um, the 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 ending and the depiction of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, killing. Mm-hmm. You know, that now based on what um, Deborah Johnson, you know, said at the time, mm-hmm. you know, in the archival footage, I, I remember when it got to that part. You know, and I also remember what um, O'Neill had said as well. Like he broke it down on that Eyes on a Prize um, interview that he gave. He explicitly said, "This is what I did." Um, they gave me three hundred dollars for it total. That was a bonus, you know, for you know making sure that they had a key to, you know, 
the place. Um, I drew out the uh, floor plans, all of that, you know, and I wish they would have been a bit more clearer, not necessarily explicit, you know, in terms of the the um, the shooting itself. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to see the gore and everything, but I did feel like it wasn't exactly clear how how it transpired, you know, according to just this film. You know what I'm saying? Now, there are the touchstones that were very accurate. Yes, they did come in to the house um, and they got up to the floor uh, where Hampton's bedroom was. And they were outside the door and they shot into into the bedroom like there were 90 over 90 something shots, you know, fired by the Chicago PD into that bedroom. Only one fired out. And I did not see if any of the um, Panthers in the film shot back. Like, who was that one shot? And one of those shots, I believe, came from um, Mark Clark, who was the young the young brother who got shot through the door. Um, or, or somebody else. He was else. killed. He was the only other person who was killed, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, there was one shot that was um, shot back, you know, to the uh, Chicago PD. You know what I'm saying? And they didn't show that. You know, and then also um, it was related. Um, Deborah related that, you know, she could feel, you know, um, the mattress, you know, shaking because the bullets were coming in and they were hitting. They were hitting, you know, Hampton. You know what I'm saying? So I think in the film, she rolled over on top of him to protect him. But I, I, I wasn't sure if that's how it how it happened, because otherwise, how would she feel the the bullets coming in and hitting the mattress and hitting him? You know, if she's on top protecting him, you know? So the depiction of it was like, eh, that could have been a bit more, um, a bit more accurately staged. Mm -hmm. So the clarity of it was a bit better. But as far as the touchstones, like the key dialogue that she mentions of, yeah. hey, we got a broad here. I, 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 was, I was like, okay, they nailed that. Um, and then they also nailed the part about, hey, I think he's going to make it. Bam. Nah, now he's not. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and the way that they showed uh, Fishback's face, a close-up on her, it's almost like a split diopter shot, Yes, it was. It was. Yeah. Oh, it was? No, 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 oh, no, okay. no. I mean, it, okay. it felt that way to me, too, where I was like, is this old school? Is this, you know? Because you never see that technique being done anymore. Yeah. And that part was very effective because then it relates to that's how um, in the weeks after and years later, she's able to recount exactly what they said because she heard it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I thought that that particular shot was well staged right there, you know. Um, and then I was I was hoping a bit after that, you know, that in the aftermath of that, we would have had maybe just a, a, a another scene or so before they, you know, cut the present day of like, you know, maybe O'Neill really having regrets about this. And when he went, when he went to go meet Mitchell, you know, and get the bonus, they kind of did that. I wish they would have emphasized like how much money it was. It was just $300 to betray this, activist who was doing so much positive work for the community yeah. and possibly could have been a great bastion for humanity within this country and perhaps the world we just will never know yeah but for 300 bucks 300 dollars you portray you you betrayed you portrayed this man this young man you know i wish more emphasis would have been placed on that as well and his fallout from that you know what I mean? So, Adrian, it was actually three hundred dollars. It was three hundred dollars, and O'Neill said, and that was a bonus. It was it was a bonus for you know supplying the floor plans, um, getting the uh, the uh, duplicate key made, and everything. That was his bonus, yeah. three hundred dollars. And O'Neill, I think, denied that he drugged Hampton. Yeah, that yeah. Although you know it is you know it's widely understood that that he did. But you know, three hundred dollars. What is that? Ten times what Judas got for uh, for betraying Jesus? Three mm. thirty thirty pieces of gold, or whatever. So, exactly. That's interesting. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, interesting. If that's an accurate accurate number. Um, a bit of trivia before we before we wrap it up, man. This had been you know, like I said, the Lucas brothers and, and other people had been trying to make and trying to get a uh, Fred Hampton film made. And my understanding is, is that, you know, the Lucas brothers and King were doing their thing 
one of them, maybe the Lucas brothers were friends or friendly with Will Burson and they knew that he had a script. And then when they got with Will Burson, they took Will Burson's script and then he and uh, Shaka King just rewrote it. And they, you know, he wrote another draft and then Burson wrote a draft and then he wrote a draft and they wrote another draft. And that's how they got to the, uh, the final script, uh, shooting script for the, for the movie. But, uh, okay. Will Burson's original script idea um, had been uh, had been pitched and uh, was in the early stages of production with F. Gary Gray, Ooh, which, wow. which would have been interesting, Ooh. very interesting. Which would have Ooh. been interesting uh, with with Gary F. Gary Gray to direct, and um, Casey Affleck was supposed to be in the movie. I guess he was going to be playing Roy Mitchell. Okay. Um, but yeah. supposedly. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> oh, no. It's, it's F. Gary Gray now, so you gotta you gotta keep that in mind. Yes, yes. He was thinking of either casting O'Shea Jackson Jr. as Hampton. Uh, go ahead. Or Jaden Smith. Oh hell no! <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? What? Uh, Are you kidding me? <laughs> now see, now see, but but you know the crazy thing about that is what? <laughs> Had he cast them just inexplicably for those roles, yeah. the, the original <laughs> title would have fit. Because like, <laughs> like just... <laughs> everything else is bullshit. You might as well go with that bullshit ass title too. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus is my homeboy. Oh, man. Oh, that's crazy. That concludes this episode of Sidebar Forever, hosted by Dwight Clark, Swain Hunt, and Adrian Johnson. You can find us online at sidebarforever.com. Any emails or questions can be directed to us at sidebarforever at gmail.com. And also, subscribe to us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram.